Malachi chapter 3, verse, starting at verse 6. Because I, the Lord, have not changed, you descendants of Jacob have not been destroyed. Since the days of your fathers, you have turned from my statutes. You have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of armies. Yet you ask, how can we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine in your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. This is the word of the Lord. In a world that is constantly changing, faster and faster it seems, we serve a God who remains faithful and unchanging in his love, his mercy and his grace. And as his children, we are called to return to him and respond in faithfulness and trust and obedience, recognising that everything that we have ultimately belongs to him anyway. We've been working our way through this short but powerful book of Malachi, and the issue at hand is abundantly clear. God's people have become indifferent to the things of God. We've seen how they claimed that God didn't love them. They were bringing blemished sacrifices. They weren't honouring him and they weren't faithful to the wife of their youth. They were indifferent and unfaithful to God and that affected every part of their lives. And yet what is the very first thing that God reminds them of in this passage? Let's pray and then we'll have a look at it. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are unchanging. Your faithfulness, uh, your mercy, your love astounds us. Father, astound us again today as we look at your word. Teach us, change us, make us more like your son. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, I'm at point one on the outline. There's an outline on the inside of the the bulletin that you've got there and then the top right-hand side of the inside, uh, there's three um, questions, uh, household questions to look at over lunch or during the week. So to answer my question before I prayed, God says, because I, the Lord, have not changed, you, descendants of Jacob, have not been destroyed. These reassuring words remind us, as it did the people in the time of Malachi, of God's mercy and faithfulness towards his people. Did you notice, though, that he used the name Jacob instead of Israel? Now, I think that's because he wanted to remind them who their father was and how they were being just like him. Uh, You remember Jacob, uh, the younger twin, Uh, from when we looked at Genesis uh, earlier on, the grasper, the deceiver. The exiles that God had so graciously brought back to the promised land were acting more like the younger Jacob than they were the older Israel, who God renewed the covenant with at Bethel in Genesis 35. In the context of our passage, the prophet Malachi addresses the people of Israel, the descendants of Jacob. Because despite their rebelliousness and unfaithfulness, God's mercy spared them from destruction. Throughout their history, the Israelites repeatedly turned away from God. 
worshipped idols and broke his commandments. Yet God remained faithful to his covenant promises, preserving his chosen people, just a remnant at this stage in Malachi. God's steadfast love, mercy and faithfulness remains constant. In Lamentations uh, chapter 3, we have the prophet Jeremiah declaring the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. While God's faithfulness is evident throughout the Old Testament, it finds its ultimate fulfilment in Jesus, doesn't it? We have those uh, well-known words in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the embodiment of God, of God's faithfulness. He came to earth as a perfect expression of God's love and mercy. His life and ministry showcased God's faithfulness in remarkable ways. He fulfilled countless prophecies spoken by the prophets of old, demonstrating that God is a faithful, promise-keeping God and his promises endure across generations to us today. His birth in Bethlehem, his miraculous works, his teachings of truth and grace and ultimately his sacrificial death on the cross and his resurrection to life all serve as evidence of God's unchanging faithfulness, mercy and love. His obedience to his heavenly Father, even to death on the cross, highlights the depth of God's love and faithfulness toward his people. In Philippians 2 verse 8, the Apostle Paul describes his obedience, saying, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus' selfless act of sacrifice opened the way for us to be reconciled to God magnifying God's faithfulness to his redemptive plan. I'm at point two now, and in the time of Malachi, the people of Israel had grown complacent, indifferent, faithless in their worship, and they had neglected their responsibilities as stewards of God's blessings. They withheld their tithes and offerings, failing to honour God with their resources. This unfaithfulness resulted in spiritual and material consequences. But as we explore the call to return to God, it's crucial to recognise that their unfaithfulness, and indeed ours, stems from a much deeper issue, a divided heart. In Malachi's time, the people of Israel outwardly performed religious rituals, yet their hearts were far from him. Their worship had become mere tradition and routine, lacking any sincere devotion and love for God. Jesus addressed this issue during his earthly ministry, didn't he? In Matthew 15, he quotes the prophet Isaiah saying, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship mean vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus saw through the external display of religion and emphasised the importance of genuine, wholehearted devotion to God. The exact same issue that God was identifying in Malachi. And I want to ask, is this an issue for us today? Is this an issue for you today? A divided heart clouds our relationship with God and leads to continuing unfaithfulness. But that unfaithfulness plays out in every part of our lives. But James, in chapter 4, verse 8, urges us, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. When our hearts and minds are divided, we waver in our commitment to God, to his people. We are so easily swayed by worldly temptations and perceived priorities. Jesus warned about the consequences of divided loyalty in our Matthew reading, didn't he? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve both God and money. This highlights the danger of placing the treasures of this world above our devotion to God, to our treasures in heaven. It leads to a lack of trust in his care and his provision and a distortion of how we place our priorities. Recognising our unfaithfulness and the ways in which we have robbed God and walked away from him, walked away from his people perhaps, we are drawn back to verse 7 and the call, return to me and I will return to you. This invitation to return is a testament to God's grace and willingness to restore every broken relationship. Since the days of your ancestors, he says, but really God has been calling every generation since Adam and Eve hid in the garden to return to him. And he continues to call us today to leave behind our divided hearts and minds and return to him from our unfaithful ways. In the New Testament, we see many examples of individuals who return to God in repentance and experience his forgiveness and restoration. Of course, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15 vividly illustrates God's eagerness to welcome back those who humbly come to him seeking repentance. (coughs) Excuse me. Just as the prodigal son's father ran out to embrace him, God came down to meet us so that we could return to him. To truly to return to God, we must address this issue of a divided heart, a divided mind. In Psalm 86 verse 11, David gives us a heartfelt prayer saying, Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. Is that your prayer? To seek God's teaching, his guidance, allowing him to transform your heart and mind to align with his character. Because it's very easy to read that along, along with me. But do you really mean it? Do you really want to be taught by God and to have an undivided heart? Of course, the best example of that wholehearted devotion is found in the life of Jesus. Throughout the Gospels, we see his unwavering commitment to the will of his heavenly Father. In John 6.38, he says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus' heart was wholly dedicated to fulfilling the Father's plan of salvation even when faced with the greatest suffering and sacrifice. We get a bit of a hint of how uh, Jesus is able to do that in Mark one thirty five. Mark describes how Jesus would withdraw to solitary places to pray early in the morning, seeking guidance and strength from his Father for the troubles that lay ahead. This deep, unbroken connection with God enabled Jesus to remain faithful and obedient even in the face of intense trials, temptations and suffering. Returning to God requires seeking his work, his transforming work within us. In Romans 12.2, the Apostle Paul instructs us, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. Now, Bishop Rod reminded us a few weeks ago that we can't do it on our own. It's not possible. The transformation begins by surrendering our divided hearts to God and allowing him to renew our minds and to align our desires with his Like Jesus and David, we must cultivate a lifestyle of prayer, seeking God's presence and guidance throughout every day. Because prayer shows our dependence on God. We invite him to shape our hearts, to align our priorities, to reveal any areas of unfaithfulness, of divided loyalties. It's in his presence that we find the strength and conviction to wholeheartedly devote ourselves 
to him. I'm at point three now and we see that usual question and answer session that that most chapters in Malachi have. And he confronts them with a bold question. Will a man rob God? And you can almost hear them saying, no, that's not possible. But before they get a chance to that, he says, yet you rob me. These words serve as a wake-up call to the people, highlighting their unfaithfulness in withholding their tithes and offerings. While the concept of tithing might seem outdated, the principle behind it remains totally relevant today. Tithing, as commanded in the Old Testament, refers to the practice of giving one-tenth of your production to God, to the temple. The purpose of tithing was to support the work of the temple, to provide for the priests and the Levites who couldn't provide for themselves, to assist the poor, to contribute to the overall well-being of the community. But tithing's not merely a financial obligation, is it? No, it's a spiritual act of trust and obedience. It's an act of acknowledging that God is the ultimate owner and provider of all that they and all that we have. Like the Israelites, in holding back, we deny God the opportunity to demonstrate his faithfulness in providing for our needs. It reveals a lack of gratitude for all that God has already blessed us with. Now, the Israelites had neglected their responsibility to bring all the tithes and offerings to God, and their neglect wasn't just an oversight. It was a deliberate act of disobedience and mistrust. They were withholding what rightfully belonged to God and keeping it for themselves. Though the passage from Malachi was directed to the Israelites of the time, its underlying principles must be applied to us today. While the practice of tithing doesn't appear in the New Testament, the broader concept of faithful stewardship remains relevant. Just as the Israelites were called to acknowledge that the resources come from God, we too must recognise that everything that we have, our income, our possessions, our talents, our time, are all gifts that are entrusted to us by God. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? As I said, tithing is not required under the new covenant. Instead, the New Testament emphasises the principles of generosity, sacrificial giving and supporting the work of God's kingdom and his people. As Paul instructs the Corinthian believers in 2 Corinthians 9, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. It's worth noting, though, that Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, when speaking about a collection for the saints in Jerusalem, he recommended a weekly setting aside of an amount in keeping with how one is prospering. Add to that Jesus' words, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. And suddenly a tenth seems pretty comfortable, doesn't it? Our financial resources are an area where we can demonstrate our faithful trust in our generous God. By giving generously, cheerfully and sacrificially, we honour God with our resources, we support the work of his church and we extend a helping hand to those who are in need. While the consequences of robbing God might not be immediately evident, there are spiritual implications for those who withhold from God. By refusing to prioritise God in our finances and neglecting to support his work, we risk hindering our own spiritual growth, missing out on the joy of giving and limiting the impact that we can have in advancing his kingdom with him. God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our finances, but he wants our heart and those things will follow. 
To be a faithful steward, we must recognise that everything that we have belongs to God. The earth and all that is in it are his creation, and he has entrusted us as stewards to manage his blessings wisely. King David acknowledged this truth in 1 Chronicles 29, Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. When we realise that we are mere stewards in God's kingdom, we can't help but have a humble and grateful attitude towards him, can we? And it prompts us to use our resources, our time and our talents in line with his will, with his purposes. It requires genuine repentance from unfaithfulness and a desire to align our lives with God's character. Again, using the parable of the prodigal son, he squandered what he had. He squandered his inheritance before it was even due to him. But when he came to his senses, he humbly returned to his father and repented of his actions. Like him, we must acknowledge our failures and turn away from selfishness, from greed and from worldly materialism. That is so attractive, so tempting and bombards us every day. It involves a lifestyle of generosity and gratitude. Paul never talks about a tithe, but maybe that's because he didn't want to limit Christians to that. In 2 Corinthians 9, again, but in verse 6 this time, he encouraged the Corinthian church, saying, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. But generosity goes beyond financial giving, doesn't it? It encompasses all of us, the whole of us. When we willingly give of ourselves, we demonstrate our trust in God, in his provision, in his ownership of our lives. As well, cultivating an attitude of gratitude helps us recognise the abundance of blessings that he has already lavished on us. A heart of thankfulness will transform our perspective, leading us to a deeper appreciation for God's faithfulness and generosity. I'm up to the last point, point five on their outline now. And the command in verse 10 is simple. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. In chapter one, the issue with the offering was its quality. Here in chapter 3, the issue is its quantity. They are short-changing God. They aren't giving all that they are supposed to give. Well, ask Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5 how it works out when you agree to give God an amount and then fail to give all that you said. And from the end of verse 10, God promises that if they will return to him, as shown through their offerings, then he will bless them in ways they can't even begin to imagine. In Proverbs 3, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. That proverb could well have been said to the people of Malachi, couldn't it? It's almost exactly the same. But we all know how much tougher it is to get by today than perhaps just as little as 12 months ago. Our home loan interest rate was under 3%. Now it's just under 7 Along with food, fuel and electricity being so much more expensive, we're all feeling the strain. And it was no different for the people in Malachi's time. They had everything taken from them when they were exiled and it's safe to say that though they were returned to the land, they didn't return with any extras. Uh, One writer describes it as a time of disillusion, disheartening and decay. In no respect did the new temple rival the magnificence and the splendour of the former one and its completion had not yet ushered in the messianic era. The population continued to struggle along with droughts, bad crops, 
and insolent neighbours. It's understandable, isn't it, that they would withhold a part of their production to help with the struggle, to help them get by. We too might be tempted to, as well to withhold more of our income or more of our time, more of our self from God, from his work, from his people. But it's actually quite silly, isn't it? What does God say in verse 10? Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God. Bring in the full amount. God is not limited by our circumstances, our resources. He can provide for us in miraculous and unexpected ways. Just as Jesus multiplied the loaves and fish to feed the multitudes, God can multiply our offerings and use them to meet not only our needs but also the needs of others. Added to that, it allows us to experience the joy of being used by God for his purposes. In Acts 20.35, the Apostle Paul reminds us of Jesus' words, it's more blessed to give than to receive. As we give of ourselves, our resources, we take part in God's work of transforming lives and expanding his kingdom here on earth. And I ask, is there a greater earthly blessing available to us? In closing, returning to and being faithful to God is not just about giving tithes and offerings, is it? It's a whole way of life that recognises God's ownership, embraces generosity and gratitude, and follows the example of Jesus' obedience. As we return to God in thankful, faithful trust, we experience his abundant blessings in ways that we can't imagine. God's people around the world today have been promised great and glorious things, just as God's people of old had been. Yet like Israel, upon returning from the exile, the glory that we so eagerly await remains sadly elusive as we live under the sun in this fallen world. But the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Sin and sickness, abuse and maligning, discouragement and setbacks, such is the lot of those who live in a broken world. Indeed, some suffering is unique to followers of Jesus. But like Paul, we can be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Like the faithful remnant who determined to trust the Lord no matter what in Malachi's day, we too must cling to God and his promises, regardless of what we face. The curse of the fall infects all aspects of life, yet the coming final restoration will redeem all aspects of life. This restoration has already started in Jesus and it's guaranteed to all of God's children. Remember that first verse. God does not change. He keeps his promises. His people will not be destroyed. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your unchanging faithfulness, your love and mercy towards us. Father, help us to understand what it's like to be your children. Help us, Father, to understand uh, what it's like to be uh, your son. Help us to be like him. Father, help us to respond in faithfulness as you are faithful to us. Amen.